morning, everyone. Lots of news to bring you on the economy this morning, not least a warning of a £60 billion black hole in public finances. First, we want to update you, though, on what's happening in Ukraine overnight. A UK spy chief has given his analysis on the war in Ukraine, saying that Russia is in a tight spot and Ukraine is turning the tide. That, as there's reports of more than a dozen fresh airstrikes in Zaporizhia overnight. In a speech to be given today, Sir Jeremy Fleming, who is the director of GCHQ, will say this. Their gains are being reversed. The cost to Russia in people and equipment are staggering. We know, and Russian commanders on the ground also know, that their supplies and munitions are running out. Russia's forces are exhausted. The use of prisoners to reinforce and now the mobilisation of tens of thousands of inexperienced conscripts speaks of a desperate situation. Yesterday, President Putin ordered a wave of missile strikes in several cities across Ukraine. At least 14 people were killed and almost 100 have been injured. President Zelensky condemned uh, Russia's uh, terrorist state. Ukraine cannot be intimidated, only united even more. Ukraine cannot be stopped, only convinced even more that terrorists must be neutralized. The Russian army specifically struck these blows precisely during the morning rush hour. This is a typical terrorist tactic. Well, these are the latest images uh, reaching us here at, at Sky Center. We know that uh, the leader of Ukraine has once again asked for the support of the British government pictures that we showed you first uh, yesterday morning. I'm pleased to say the Deputy Prime Minister is with us here in the studio. Good morning to you. Thank Good morning. you for joining us. Um, what support can you offer them? Well, I think we continue the support that we've been giving and uh, uh, the Prime Minister has was Foreign Secretary beforehand working in uh, step with our Defence Secretary Ben Wallace and at the time Prime Minister Boris Johnson and we continue to do that and we need to make sure that the West is also resolved to making sure that Putin must fail and the people of Ukraine must succeed. OK, so is there anything specific that we can do to help them, given these missile strikes that we have seen uh, over the last couple of nights? Well, of course, some of these operational matters of the direct support will be given, will be held, um, uh, discussed confidentially, confidentially with uh, both within government but also with the uh, Ukrainian president. And uh, I know that we have always stepped up to deliver what we can, but this is a time for con other countries to continue uh, the level of support that they've been showing and where necessary to escalate uh, their, their level of support directly to the Ukrainian armed forces as we have done. OK, this is our first opportunity to chat since the conference um, and there has been uh, a further slump in the polls. How are you going to get back on track? Well, I'm very conscious that we've uh, set out a plan for growth. Um, there's a whole uh, continuing of different policy uh, improvements to try and help and lock our growth challenges that we've been facing. And indeed, the uh, Chancellor announced yesterday he's brought forward the medium-term fiscal plan to the 31st of October. Why has he done that? I think he's chosen to do that, uh, recognising that we uh, wanted to uh, get on and show how our plans and make sure people have confidence that they can get on and start delivering them. Um, and uh, he's decided that we're in a position where we can bring that forward. It's not because the market's getting jittery again? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I think it's about uh, doing a lot of work, um, uh, pace, uh, understandably. Uh, but I think he decided that we're in a good state and we'll continue to discuss this across government and indeed with parliamentary colleagues um, over the few weeks ahead. You say in a good state, but uh, the director of the Institute uh, for Fiscal Studies is saying this morning that there's a £60 billion black hole uh, in your figures. And that's either going to be done to sort it out with a hatchet to public spending or the equivalent of a 10p increase in the basic rate of tax. Which one? Well, I think the IFS uh, obviously does its own modelling. Uh, the government works uh, with the Bank of England and the OBR on these measures. Uh, and that's uh, what uh, Treasury has been working on and doing different discussions with different departments. Uh, but I think um, the IFS also pointed out, if we don't grow, then this problem will get worse and worse. And that's why, very clearly, totally the that. Prime Minister and Chancellor set out a plan for growth. Uh, a lot of that, of course, was the important element 
of giving assurance to household and to businesses about what support they would get on energy costs, uh, much of which is not in the direct control of people. And we've already seen an impact in the reduction of inflation uh, forecasts just from the measures that we've taken. But to consider, we've had this uh, aftershock of COVID. We've still not quite yet got the global supply chain going again. And we still have the huge problems on energy security uh, which is affecting not just this, has been affecting just this country, but of course also uh, countries right across Europe and elsewhere in the world. But so, people should be assured we have the second lowest debt uh, to GDP ratio in the G7. Uh, still got a £60 billion pound black hole though. Um, how are you going to fill <clears throat> it? Well, um, I'm just uh, flagging that uh, IFS has come up with its own modelling. Is it wrong? And the that chance of, uh, that's uh, not for me to say, that's their forecasts. Uh, the Chancellor will be speaking at the end of the month uh, with the medium-term fiscal plan. OK, but uh, suggestions are that you will have to find, on their figures for now, we'll hear yours, as you say, by the end of the month, if you don't um, fix these figures with an increase in basic rate of income tax, you'll need to reduce um, the budget of every department except the NHS and Defence by 15%. Is there that much fat to get rid of? Well, I'm just not going to get into hypotheticals, Kay. Um, the Chancellor um, is working on that. Uh, with, uh, as I say, aspects of the OBR, other departments right now uh, to go through. Um, but I, the government is united. We have to get growth. Um, otherwise, uh, uh, th and that will help us uh, to fund our public sectors in the future as well. OK. Um, so you're not going to get into figures. We'll just have to wait and see till the 31st of October. As I said, the market's getting jittery again. One wonders what they might do <clears throat> between now and then. What we do know is that Santander are saying that they're setting, um, just looking at the exact quote from their boss, saying they're having to set aside more money for defaults uh, because uh, they think that people are just not going to be able to afford their mortgages going forward. How do you reassure them otherwise? Well, the Bank of England sets the uh, interest rates for the country and um, it's for their projection to decide. They, we've had historically low interest rates for uh, many years now. And of course, uh, going through COVID, there was a lot of work done uh, when many people either weren't, uh, uh, were benefiting from furlough or indeed were not, uh, who I had to be helped no, with not, that. Not I'm furlough. just flagging that. That was then, that was then. That's just historically what the government did to help people. The, Bank of, England, the Bank of England uh, sets uh, the interest rates. So it'll be... Uh, what responsibility should this government take? Well, the Bank of England uh, sets interest rates. Um, I'm not aware that any other commentator wants the government to start setting interest rates again. Um, and I doubt uh, Santander does as well. But the sorts of policies that we've shown, like our support to both households and uh, businesses in substantial energy uh, package, building on the £37 billion pounds that we had already Talking uh, about in place building, you're talking delivered. about ditching um, home targets for affordable homes. Why are you doing that? Uh, I'm not aware of any of that. Uh, so that isn't true? I'm, I'm not that aware. That isn't of... true, that uh, apparently ministers have drawn up plans to exempt developers from having uh, to build affordable homes to scrap environmental protections and to allow people to add extensions without permission. That, according to Simon Clark, that's not right. I'm not aware of that uh, policy, but uh, if you want to ask Simon Clark about policies... Well, you're the Deputy uh, Prime Minister, with all due respect. Um, well, you're just throwing comments at me, uh, Kay. Um, I'm not aware of... So it's uh, not something that's been discussed around the... I'm not aware of uh, specific uh, things like that, no. OK, how interesting. Of course, um, I'm Secretary of State for Health, and that's... Uh, I have come on today to talk about what we're doing to help tackle the backlogs, and I'm pleased to be announcing a further 10 community diagnostic centres uh, to be opened. I'm actually opening one formally today in London, but places in Burnley, uh, places in uh, Merseyside, uh, places in the Isle of Wight will be getting a diagnostic centre because we know getting on and delivering for patients is really important. And those diagnostics are a key part of making sure whether we know if people need treatment or not. And that is one of the uh, critical backlogs that we need to get fixed. Mm, um, also talking about uh, national insurance rights being scrapped today in Parliament. That's uh, £36 billion pounds over three years that will be gone. How will you protect the NHS, given that that money was going to be spent on the NHS and social care? Well, that was going to be, a, um, in effect, a hypothecated levy uh, that was set aside. Uh, the Prime Minister said clearly during her leadership campaign she didn't think it was right to put up taxes. Uh, and so... Uh, this will be funded more generally from uh, general taxation uh, rather than specific levies. So uh, it's, uh, the funding is still there in order to make sure both social care and health system, particularly that money was intended in the health system for tackling backlogs that we spend that uh, and then moving on to aspects of social care, of which we'll be doing the first down payment this winter. 
the £500 million to be allocated uh, across uh, the country. Nurses uh, balloting to strike for the first time in 106 years, also relevant to your department. What are you going to do about that? Well, I understand um, that uh, the ballot is now open. Uh, we have honoured the independent pay review body's recommendations on this, uh, and uh, that was a higher than many of the other pay rises that uh, other public sector workers are getting. Uh, and I'm confident um, that uh, those uh, elements will continue to... Dare I say it, uh, having respected the independent pay review body, I'm not anticipating that we'll be making any further changes. OK, so it looks as though it'll have a strike on your hands? Well, I think that's a decision for the uh, nurses who uh, decide how to vote this, um, this, uh, uh, in this next coming month. OK, but, I mean... You're sitting here as the Deputy Prime Minister this morning. Nurses threatening to strike for the first time in 106 years. The head of Santander saying he's having to put extra money aside because he thinks that people are going to default on their mortgages. The Institute for Fiscal Studies saying there's a £60 billion black hole in your figures. Um, and you just think the country will just carry on running as it is? Well, no, we need to change. That's why we need a plan for growth and why we have a plan but for I've growth. But I've asked you for it. And it's, well, that was set out a few weeks ago. And then the medium-term fiscal plan is what the Chancellor will be saying at the end of the month. So it's not exactly business as usual. That's why, in my role as Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, we've got real focus on ABCD, the ambulances, backlogs I'm talking about today, as well as uh, some of the things that we'll be doing in terms of care, including the discharge fund uh, for this winter. So uh, we'll continue to try and uh, make progress in delivering for patients and indeed uh, delivering right across the country, including uh, the delivery of the energy cost package where we are supporting homes and indeed uh, businesses. You talk about the ABCD plan, which we've heard a lot about, uh, both from you, uh, from the Prime Minister, also from uh, Nadim Zahari, who spoke about it too. What can we expect on the tobacco control plan? Well, I'm focused at the moment on the ABCD. There's a whole number of different uh, prevention uh, strategies which are already underway and some are being considered. Uh, my immediate uh, focus has been ABCD about... Uh, we've created uh, within the uh, NHS, local NHS boards, that are uh, referred to as in integrated care system boards, uh, care systems which have a board, and that's where I'm intending to put all of our effort and focus on how we get that local... A health and social care system really working uh, together. So that's that's where I'm putting a lot of my focus right now. OK, the plan was vital, we were told, to help the government uh, realise its ambition of becoming smoke-free by 2030. We heard that from Sajid Javid. Reducing the number of 15-year-olds who smoke from 8 to 3%. Reducing smoking adults in England from 155 to 12%. Reducing inequality gap in smoking prevalence. End of 2022 was the target. Has that target been scrapped? I... I'm not aware any targets being scrapped. Um, so is but it going I'm, to go ahead then? I'm not aware any targets being scrapped. My focus right now is the ABCD. Uh, there's quite a lot of prevention programmes already underway. Uh, and I'll be, of course, looking at uh, many more of these in detail. <laughs> there's quite a lot of ambition that we have uh, looking at, say, at the cancer plan. Again, we're going through that carefully. And my expectation, as the Prime Minister set out, is we'll publish that by the end of the year. Um, OK, um, my producer's just talking to me in my ear as I'm talking to you, so if she, if she could just take me again, I think it's something from the Bank of England. Bear with me. Uh, there's a warning I'm being told from the Bank of England. And uh, apparently there's an ongoing route in the gilts market, a material risk in UK financial stability. Thoughts on that? Well, it's news to me as well, and uh, I suggest but that... But you're the uh, Deputy Prime Minister, you have to have views on these things. I've just been sat here for the last 10 to 15 minutes. You weren't and... expecting it. Uh, it's a matter, uh, dare I say it, for the Chancellor. I'm sure that you can follow up with the Chancellor today. Uh, the bank is saying that it's going to have to bolster its emergency bond uh, buying plan. Well, the Bank of England is the responsible organisation uh, and uh, it's for them and the Chancellor to work together on this matter. It's good to talk to you as always. Thank you very much Thank you. for uh, joining us. Let's have a look at uh, what Ed Conway has been saying uh, with his... Uh, um, latest graphs. Uh, he's uh, joining us in just a second. This is what he said earlier. Just what is Kwasi Kwarteng going to have to do to try and sort out the public finances? Well, we have one answer from the Institute for Fiscal Studies. We've got their green budget. It basically looks at all of this stuff. And here, perhaps, is the most important chart. It shows you the national debt, so the total amount that the UK government owes. And that has built up over many, many years. A lot of that's due to COVID. But here's the thing. We're looking through to the future here. And what you can probably see from this is that it was more or less flattening and starting gradually to fall. That's gradually going down uh, in the coming years. 
But here's what happened in the mini-budget. The government basically added a lot to it. So whether it's the energy price guarantee, all of those other measures reversing those tax increases, you can see that's going up. And that's the thing that markets are concerned about. Certainly the IFS is concerned about it as well. And the big question is, how do you bring that down? How do you kind of get that slab down so that you are bringing the national debt lower? Well, that costs a lot of money. According to the IFS and City, who are looking at these numbers, £62 billion needs to be removed. And where do you get £62 billion from? Well, it's a lot of money. Let me just show you for illustration some of the things you could cut or change to get to it. But it's just illustration. This stuff is pretty controversial. For instance, uprating benefits by earnings, so not raising them in line with inflation. It means a real terms cut for those, uh, many of those who are on uh, benefits. £13 billion pounds you can get from that. You can get about £14 billion pounds by cutting your investment spending. But here's the thing. Investment spending is one of the things that generates growth. And if this government really is about growth, 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 that doesn't seem like the obvious thing to cut. Or, finally, uh, you could cut non-NHS or uh, defence spending, their day-to-day -day spending. That's basically like austerity. But if you cut it by about 15%, then you're talking about £35 billion, pounds, quite a lot of money. But none of these are very palatable options. The final option, the one the government would most like and everyone would most like, is to get growth. The more growth you have, the lower that has to be. But here's the thing, even if you assume there's going to be perhaps 0.25% extra growth, that's what City uh, says is possible, you're still talking about £41 billion. Pounds. You're still talking about potential cuts, you're still talking about potential austerity. Those are the choices facing Kwasi Kwarteng, none of them particularly palatable, but that's where he stands right now. We've been getting fresh data on the economy this morning. Uh, that those uh, uh, latest figures that we're just getting, the latest warning from the Bank of England. More on that in just a second. First, though, our business and politics correspondent Amanda Akas is here with me. Amanda, figures coming thick and fast this morning. Try and dissect it all for me. Yes, yeah, so the latest stats we've got from the Office of National Statistics and the latest quarter number of people in work. So unemployment has fallen again to a new record low, 3.5%. That's the lowest it's been since 1974. But interestingly, the number of economically inactive people is about a fifth of the population. And the number of people who are off work because of long-term sickness is now at record high, um, which is, is quite interesting given the pressures that we're seeing on the NHS, the long waiting list, the number of people uh, suffering suffering uh, with long COVID and so on. Now, also, the other key thing to know from this is about um, earnings. Uh, so in this, we can see that average um, regular pay fell when adjusted for inflation by 4%. Now, that's in real terms, um, but that is, isn't quite as bad as last time when it fell by 4.1%. But clearly, it really shows you the struggle people are having trying to keep up with inflation, the, as the, the, how they can pay for things with the earnings that they've got. Mm. Particularly, which politically, we know this big debate that's going on at the moment is whether or not benefits should be going up in line with inflation or average earnings. Average earnings aren't doing very well, so it's even a bigger gulf between the difference that we're seeing if they went up in line with inflation, um, then that would would obviously cost the government a lot more money but would stop a lot more people from falling into poverty. Indeed so and these figures we get uh, once a month, once a quarter? Uh, once a month yes indeed okay. it's the average amount for the previous three months so uh, fundamentally it shows us we know that a lot of people are in work there are a lot of vacancies not quite as many vacancies um, as we've been seeing recently but still really historically record highs 1.2 uh, million or so um, across the entire labour market but the number of people that are inactive that's going up as well so we can see that um, for all the government is trying to do to get people into earning you know working more hours earning more money that clearly isn't really Really, um, being affected and people's real, the amount of money people are actually taking home um, is going down effectively and that's what they're feeling in their pockets. OK, let's bring in Tamara, should we? She's standing by in Downing Street for us this morning and tomorrow expecting um, another cabinet meeting later on. But uh, those uh, latest uh, warnings from the Bank of England, uh, we didn't get much response from the Deputy Prime Minister, but it's going to be alarming, isn't it? Morning, Kay. Yes, Liz Truss is chairing her first cabinet meeting since a chaotic party conference and very bad news for the Conservatives in the polls with Labour uh, having huge leads uh, in almost all of them. Now, we expect that expected this, this meeting to be dominated by uh, the decision over benefits and whether to raise them by the rate of inflation, which senior figures in cabinet feel uh, the government should. But it's all been put in perspective today by uh, this overview from the Institute of Fiscal Studies 
about how the Chancellor is going to balance the books, how to fill that black hole uh, that he created uh, with the mini budget. And they're talking about £60 billion needing uh, to be found over the coming years if he is to get the debt falling as a percentage of GDP, which is what he said that he would do and announce his plan for that uh, c coming forward at the end of the month. So where might the axe fall? Well, Therese Coffey said that will be for the Chancellor uh, to decide. We expect that the NHS and defence budgets would be protected, although, of course, both are being er er eroded currently by inflation. So uh, the inflation situation makes all of that a lot more difficult. We've just heard from the Bank of England in the last uh, few moments. It's the second uh, tweak to this big bond-buying operation uh, that they launched uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in the light of the mini-budget. And um, we, we know that they're extending the scope of it essentially, after it emerged yesterday uh, that the borrowing rates are as high as on the day they intervened. So we wait to see exactly what the impact of all this is going to be on the market. But it is more uh, grim news uh, for the Chancellor on a day that he will be facing MPs in the Commons today for Treasury questions. And of course, the government is trying to ram its legislation through Parliament to reverse that rise in national insurance uh, today. So we'll see how much reaction there is from the Conservative benches on that. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for now, Tamara. Quick look at the papers for you. Uh, and the I says Trust faces showdown with rebels ahead of a cabinet meeting later this morning. The FT says the Chancellor and the Bank of England failed to calm the markets as interest rates on government bonds rose again yesterday. Uh, the day death rained from the sky is the headline in the mail, referring to what it calls Vladimir Putin's blitz on several Ukrainian cities. The Guardian reports that President Zelensky is pleading for more help to combat Russian attacks. Joined now by our security and defence editor, Deborah Haynes. Um, hi, Deborah. Uh, tell us what the spy chief is telling us and what does that mean, both for Russia and indeed for Ukraine? So it's the head of GCHQ who's going to be giving a speech later on today. And we had some excerpts of what he's going to say released to us. And he made some very stark comments on the war in Ukraine. He said that Russia is running out of munitions and supplies, um, that that Russia has already incurred a staggering, in his words, cost in terms of personnel and equipment lost. And then he also went on to talk about the impact on the Russian people, the fact that they are fleeing the draft, the fact that prisoners are being deployed on the battlefield, saying that's a mark of desperation. And this all comes at a time when Russia really has escalated the conflict with those devastating airstrikes yesterday in response to those mysterious blasts on the bridge linking the Crimean Peninsula with the Russian mainland. And the, the thinking now is that, yes, while Western wep well, Russian weapons might well be running out, the West is also under strain. The Western weapons are key for Ukrainian success. Russia is not giving up. It is doubling down. So while, yes, maybe Russia is running out of supplies, its forces are exhausted, they're not going away. And that's why you had President Zelensky yesterday speaking to President Biden. He also spoke to our Prime Minister, Liz Truss, and he said that his number one priority is on air defences. The country desperately needs to be able to better protect itself and on strengthening its armed forces further. So this is a moment of escalation. It's a moment of danger and clearly the UK spy chief is um, is hoping that Russia is going to run out of, uh, of weapons, but it hasn't at the moment. Um, these uh, missiles that came in yesterday with such devastation hitting playgrounds and bridges and the like, we had thought that the Russians were very depleted in the stocks of those, but again, we've seen more overnight into Zaporizhia. We have, and also the emergency services have put the entire country on alert again today, telling people to stay in shelters, not to ignore air raid sirens. It's been going on for months. People, you know, you hear the air raid siren and you often just put it to the back of your mind because sure. you don't think a missile is going to land close to you. But clearly yesterday we saw they've still got that capability. It also seems they've been planning that attack for a while. It wasn't just some spontaneous um, moment uh, in terms of responding to the bridge, that that might have 
precipitated it. But yes, you're right. It clearly shows they haven't run out of stocks. They're also using Iranian weapons too, Iranian kamikaze drones as part of their strikes. Um, and they've clearly got the ability to do, to do more. And they're saying that they are going to respond as long as the West continues to support Ukraine, then Russia will respond. That's what the Deputy Foreign Minister has been saying today. OK, and when will we hear this, um, the speech from our spy chief? It's going to be at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Lovely. Or 2.30. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come, early afternoon. Still to come on the programme for you right now, though, Labour's Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Pat McFadden, will be with me soon after 8 o'clock. We'll be speaking to the former presenter and model, that's Penny Lancaster, and uh, Labour MP Carolyn Harris, as they work to tackle the stigma surrounding the menopause also speaking to the Ukraine ambassador to the UK after Russia launched dozens of airstrikes right across the country. In other news, Harry Kane will wear a One Love armband at the World Cup in Qatar, even if it's prohibited or punishable by FIFA. The FA has not yet received permission from FIFA to wear the armband, which forms part of an anti-discrimination initiative, despite asking three weeks ago. But the team are determined to have the captain wear it, even if it risks fines. Well, let's get more, should we? Shaman uh, is standing by for us this morning. Um, hello to you, Shaman. Tell us more about this. Oh, I think we might have a problem yeah. there <laughs> with your microphone. Can you... Uh, let's just Hold see in. if we can sort that out. Are you there? Hello, like evasion. <laughs> nope, we haven't got your mic just at the moment, but we'll sort that out and come back to you very shortly indeed. Do bear with us on that. Now, let's look at some of today's other headlines for you now. And a former uh, Labour shadow minister has been deselected from his seat. A first in more than a decade, Sam Tarry, an ally of the former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, was deselected from the Ilford South constituency by local party members. The vote means he won't be Labour's constituency candidate at the next general election. The former Shadow Transport Secretary was sacked from the job in July after unauthorised broadcast interviews from a picket line which started here on this programme. A nurse accused of murdering seven babies and attempting to kill ten others in a neonatal unit in the Countess of Chester Hospital has been described in court as a poisoner at work. A jury heard that Lucy Letby injected newborns with insulin, air or milk during night shifts when she knew their parents would not be present. Opening the prosecution case, Nick Johnson, Casey, told the jury the collapse and deaths of the 17 children named in the indictment were not naturally occurring tragedies. They were the work of the woman in the dock who was the constant malevolent presence when things took a turn for the worse. Sometimes Lucy Letby tried to kill the same baby more than once. Sometimes the baby she succeeded in killing she did not manage to kill the first time she tried or even the second time. And in one case, even the third time. The 32-year-old denies all the charges against her. New analysis shows that care workers are more likely to live in poverty than the average UK worker. Research from the Health Foundation found that one in five residential care workers in the UK were living in poverty before the cost of living crisis began. I think we've got Shaman now talking about Harry Kane wearing a One Love armband. Tell us more. <laughs> Hello, good morning, Kay. Well, the uh, FA announced back in September the intention to allow the England team to be able to wear these armbands in support of an anti-discrimination campaign and also in support of the LGBTQ plus community because in Qatar, same-sex relationships and promotion of same-sex relationships are still criminalised. But in order to wear these armbands, the FA and the England squad would, would need permission from FIFA. But as you say, despite by asking for this permission more than three weeks ago, FIFA have yet to respond. But Sky News does now understand that the England squad are prepared to wear the armbands in support and in solidarity, even if it means facing a fine or other forms of punishment. Now, uh, the England manager, Gareth Southgate, has spoken a few weeks ago about the issue and he said that there's not a lot more that the players in particular can do other than talk about those issues and put them on 
on the table because in the end, we're asking for change in a country we are respectful of, has made progress, but don't have any control over. Talking about the issues and raising the issues and putting them on the table is a vehicle that people involved in sport we've used in the past and it is what we are trying to do this time. Now, delegation from the group are meeting with FIFA in Zurich tomorrow to discuss the issue. They'll also be asking for an update on a helpline and compensation scheme for migrant workers that have been working on the facilities for the World Cup in Qatar because human rights charities have raised the fact that some that there are some issues in the way that migrant workers have been treated. Sky News has asked FIFA and the FA for comment. OK, for now, thank you. Check these pictures out. Three fishermen whose boat capsized in the Gulf of Mexico had a lucky escape when they were rescued after 24 hours stranded in shark-infested waters. There they are being rescued. Uh, the US Coast Guard said they were fending off sharks with their bare hands when their helicopter arrived. The men are being treated in hospital for shark bites. My goodness. A uh, picture of what remains of one of the fishermen's life jackets after that shark attack. Oh, goodness. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to The Breakfast Show here on Sky News Tuesday morning. Speaking to the programme this morning, the Deputy Prime Minister has said people should be assured about the state of the economy despite a fresh warning of a £60 billion black hole in the public finances. Therese Coffey told me that we needn't be too worried about the way the economy is looking. We're in a good state and we'll continue to discuss this across government and indeed with parliamentary colleagues um, over the few weeks ahead. You say in a good state, but uh, the director of the Institute uh, for Fiscal Studies is saying this morning that there's a £60 billion black hole uh, in your figures? Well, I think the IFS uh, obviously does its own modelling. Uh, the government works uh, with the Bank of England and the OBR on these measures. Uh, and that's uh, what uh, Treasury has been working on and um, doing different discussions with different departments. Uh, but I think um, the IFS also pointed out, if we don't grow, then this problem will get worse and worse. And that's why, very clearly, totally the that. Prime Minister and Chancellor set out a plan for growth. Let's bring you more now on the war in Ukraine. And President Zelensky has vowed to strengthen the country's armed forces following major Russian airstrikes, which killed at least 14 people. Russia launched attacks on cities from Lviv in the west to Kharkiv in the east. The strikes on the Ukrainian capital Kiev and Shevchenko district were the most intense, killing at least eight people and injuring dozens of others. Missiles also targeted the central city of Dnipro, where our special correspondent Alex Crawford begins her report. Commuters were on their way to work when the bombs started. This was terror and mayhem reaching fresh heights in Ukraine, and seconds later, there's an even bigger one. That's the sound of debris raining down on the car roof. The huge mushroom cloud created is captured by a driver on the other side of the road. Imagine the naked fear felt by those in the middle of all this. This was the north side of Dnipro, one of Ukraine's biggest cities. And the attacks here were replicated across a string of other cities throughout the country. It is by far the most widespread series of Russian attacks since the start of the war, hitting 11 key infrastructure facilities in eight separate regions. Quite a record with the war now in its eighth month. This was the crater caused in Dnipro by that double hit in a residential area. There are several apartment blocks around and it's on a busy bus route. This wave of Russian attacks across the country has dramatically upped the ante and suggests far from giving up, the Russian leader has once again doubled down. The residents trying to piece together their lives are full of fury. And they're feeling even more terrified after this barrage. But the strikes which rained down in the heart of the capital city were no doubt the Kremlin's main aim. 
As rumors swirled about his death, the president emerged. They praise panic and chaos. They want to destroy our nervous system. They are unnecessary. The other is the people. They specially chose such a time and such goals to avoid the most damage to the people. Among the Russian leaders' attacks, one aimed at Kyiv's landmark pedestrian bridge, narrowly missing a walker mid-route. Somehow the bridge remained intact, despite the Russian leader implying this was in retaliation for the bridge explosion in Crimea a few days ago. The missiles hit a playground in one of the capital's main parks, popular among families with children. And millions saw a young student narrowly escape death on her way to university. Many of the capital's residents had returned in recent months, believing their capital was safer now. The whistle's the sound of another missile flying in, one of 80 across the country. The Russian leaders bent on making sure they keep flying into Ukrainian territory and keep wreaking havoc. Difficult to imagine, but there could have been even more destruction, more flattened homes and deaths. Yet the Russian leadership's threatening more attacks. There's no end in sight to this misery. In fact, it's just escalated several notches. Alex Crawford, Sky News in Ukraine. Joined now from Kiev by Volodymyr Aryev, a Ukrainian MP for the European Solidarity Party. Hello to you. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. What can you tell us about um, the strikes of yesterday and this morning? Uh, we have an ongoing alarm uh, raid sorry, now and uh, the latest news that uh, one more power plant uh, uh, were uh, hit by a uh, Russian missile in Vinica region. So uh, the uh, Russian policy is ongoing and uh, yesterday uh, attack, uh, we understand that it was planned uh, in advance. Uh, uh, Putin would like to... Uh, presented like a response uh, to the uh, explosion on the Crimea bridge, but it hasn't been proven uh, who stays behind uh, uh, that attack. But for Putin, it makes no reason to find uh, a truth, but uh, to use a reason uh, for escalation in Ukraine. Uh, the reason for that, uh, for me, is uh, pretty understandable. Uh, in one month, uh, Putin is going to uh, the meeting of uh, G20 countries on uh, Bali Island in Indonesia. So he would like uh, to present him not a weak leader after defeats of uh, Russian army uh, in uh, uh, conventional, so conventional battle uh, grounds. Uh, but he would like to uh, speak to the world uh, from the position of strength. So that's why he changed uh, the commander uh, on uh, operation against Ukraine. And uh, uh, his first day uh, was an airstrike uh, to scare, uh, with the attempt to scare Ukraine. Of course, Ukrainians were not scared, but start more donate uh, to support uh, Ukrainian army. But at the second, uh, uh, we understand that uh, next month uh, we could um, be faced to the attention of new offense from the north side with the participation of Belarus as well as uh, President Lukashenko. He yesterday claimed uh, that he would like to join uh, and support uh, Russia in uh, uh, the uh, as, as, as an ally of uh, Belarus. Uh, and uh, the, 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 this means that uh, um, uh, Russia, uh, Russian plan is clearly seen uh, to uh, divert uh, Ukrainian forces from the offense on east and on the east and south, uh, and start to uh, uh, to defend much more north uh, direction. Uh, Ukrainian uh, strategists, military strategists, see what the, uh, Putin wants uh, very clear, and we are really uh, ready to all uh, kind of attacks uh, that uh, are we are facing too, but. At at the same time, we need uh, a bit more help uh, uh, to beat out uh, a new wave of uh, Russian aggression. Okay. 
What are you going to do then to retaliate? Um, we've seen these images um, yesterday. We know that there have been more strikes, as I was saying, in Zaporizhia overnight. How will you retaliate to these attacks, sir? Well, we need, uh, uh, of course, to um, strengthen the Ukrainian air defense systems. And uh, yesterday, American President Joe Biden uh, and uh, German government promised uh, uh, to supply Ukraine with uh, uh, the modern ones. But at the, at the same time, uh, what we really vitally need now, while uh, uh, Ukrainian energy systems are under reparation, as well as strikes were not only to power plants, but on, uh, also for the key system, uh, uh, key, key ground system places. So uh, I do believe that uh, in this case, uh, European uh, Union uh, could uh, be uh, uh, could could help us uh, with uh, supplying uh, electric energy as well as our systems. Uh, Ukrainian and EU are united uh, to survive as well as many regions uh, now has uh, no electricity and uh, uh, this uh, uh, this situation we don't know how long it could. Uh, uh, be taken. Okay. Um, we know that G7 leaders meeting today, G20 uh, summit uh, later on in the month in Indonesia. What's your message to those world leaders? Yesterday um, uh, was under attack uh, the visa, uh, the, the visa uh, uh, consular uh, uh, office of German embassy, and uh, the uh, German embassy were, were 200 meters from the famous. You've seen the picture, uh, the uh, missile attack in the city center of uh, Kiev. So uh, I would like to tell that if no uh, serious and decisive uh, steps, uh, we all will be under attack. So now Ukraine is a playground, uh, a battle, uh, ba ba sorry, battleground for uh, the democratic world, and we understand that uh, without. Uh, permanent and long-term assistance uh, to beat out Russian aggression and to compel Russia even to forget uh, to uh, attack other countries and neighbors so we cannot survive and uh, it will be changed uh, the world security system so we cannot let it make real so uh, to be united and decisive, uh, uh, th this is the only way what we have to do. It's good to talk to you. Um, do keep safe. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you. In other news, a new report has found that many people working in the health service are suffering bullying, harassment and unfair treatment. A survey by the British Medical Association Council found that resident medical officers are experiencing widespread poor conditions. Joining us now is the Deputy Chair of the BMA, that's Dr Emma Ronswick. Hello to you, Dr Emma, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm very keen to talk about the report. I wonder if I could just uh, briefly touch on uh, first with you, though, the Health Secretary on the show this morning saying there's no more money for nurses and if they go on strike for the first time in 100 years, so be it. That's very unfortunate to hear. Um, as, as you may know, that junior doctors and other doctors in, in the BMA are also looking for an improved pay deal from this government. It's a real great shame that Therese Coffey hasn't taken the opportunity this morning uh, to emphasise the value of medical and nursing staff to the health service um, and chosen to talk to us. We have written to Therese Coffey asking, us, uh, asking for some discussions about pay and we haven't had any responses. So it's it's unfortunate to hear that, but we are still open to talks um, and, and we wish the RCN all solidarity. Okay, do you feel that um, doctors, junior doctors might also find themselves in a position where they have no alternative but to consider strike action? Unfortunately, yes, that's the case. So the Junior Doctors Committee of the BMA have already said that if demands for increased pay aren't met, that there will be a ballot in January. So we're already on our way there for both doctors and, of course, for nurses. OK, talk to me about the um, report 
that you have done with the Doctors' Association. What were you hoping to achieve from that? So we've had a number of members come to us, a number of doctors come to us, predominantly from Nigeria, but also from other African countries who have been recruited by NES, Cape Medical, and a number of other agencies and employers and put to work either in the NHS or in private providers and, and treated really appallingly. And they've expected to be pro treated properly as if they were British workers, as if, you know, as under the standards that we have here. But unfortunately, our survey shows exploitation, lack of support, threats, particularly to visa status, poor welfare and low pay. And unsafe hours, lack of rest, working above competency or without support are really threatening patient safety in those environments. So we are looking for significant changes to their conditions, including trade union recognition to apply to all agency medical staff and for their contracts to improve up to the standards of the NHS, regardless of who the direct, direct employer is. Um, OK, um, some of the figures that uh, are in the report are really shocking, aren't they? 34% of those surveyed reported bullying and harassment, 47% reporting unfair treatment, um, and 89% report working over a 70-hour week, not only uh, damaging for the health of those that are doing those, but potentially for those that they're caring for. Absolutely. It's frankly unsafe, the conditions that people are working in. And I think that many, particularly those who are paying for their healthcare in, private, in the private sector, would be shocked and surprised by the conditions under which their medical team are working. Um, there, are, there are plenty of doctors under this survey who told us that they were working a whole week on 168 hours with minimal rest breaks during the night, which might be disturbed. And so, so 70 hours is, was really almost at the low end for many of these people. And, and the bullying is, I mean, quite horrific. I won't repeat some of the racist things that people have reported to us. Um, but I was surprised that they would, they would come to such, such harassment uh, in the UK. So who's bullying whom? So it's a mixture. So the doctors who are working for these companies are often from Nigeria or other similar nations. And they're facing bullying both from their employer, the agency, but also from their colleagues who are working alongside them in the health system. Um, and it's quite difficult to challenge that because if they challenge that, the agency or their employer is both their employer, their GMC uh, responsible officer, their visa status holder, that sometimes their landlord. So raising concerns often leaves you a position of being very trapped. Um, and it's quite difficult for people to get out of those situations. Um, one wonders who those people can turn to. Absolutely. And I mean, we're, we're encouraging those people to turn to us as their trade union. We're here to help. We have a contract checking service. We're trying to eliminate really duplicitous contracts that don't stand up to a moment's scrutiny. We're offering to support to international medical graduates who are new to the country. We're lobbying their employers for improvements to paying conditions. And we're hoping that we can tackle some of the problems with them at work um, for, for a range of these organisations, which really shouldn't be allowed to get away with this any longer. OK, good to talk to you. Um, thanks very much indeed for taking the time to join us. Much appreciated. Thank you. No worries. Thank you so much. Quick look at the weather. Anticipation is rising and so is the atmosphere. Are you ready? The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Mostly fine today. Rain moving into the west later marks a change to more unsettled conditions. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, a lot's happened since 7 o'clock this morning, let me tell you, including the fact that nurses have said that they are considering strike for the first time in more than 100 years. We put that to the health secretary and she said there will be no more pay. We put that to a representative for the British Medical Association just now and she said junior doctors 
are also thinking about uh, voting for strike action at the start of the new year. And she was saddened at the news from the Deputy Prime Minister. The Deputy Prime Minister also telling us that the economy is on track, looking good. Um, words to that effect, despite the uh, IFS saying there's a £60 billion black hole uh, in your figures and you need to sort it out as a matter of some urgency. Bank of England also reacting to that this morning and uh, we'll be telling you more about what they have had to say in just a few moments' time. Also bringing you pictures of Larry the Cat, who was looking for a bit of a spat as well, with a fox on number 10. What on 